Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Restore live stream. Uh, if you've checked in every Sunday uh, so far in January, then it's bumper Ian. Uh, three weeks of Ian on the trot. How lucky are you? What a great start to the new year, hey? Um, I hope everything is going well for you. Um, if you have been tuning in, you will know that what we're using uh, in this month and into a little bit of February is we're uh, focusing on Ezekiel 37, which is the passage that we feel like the Lord has given us for 2024. Uh, uh, the background to that and I gave in week one uh, is just a sense of a prophetic word that we had that this year is going to be a year of activation for Restore and uh, we've been through a restructuring which is uh, bones coming together which we did around the COVID uh, time uh, then uh, we've uh, gone through a time of, of the body kind of forming and the flesh coming on the bones and uh, body starting to take shape and uh, 2024 is going to be the year that we experience the wind the breath of God's spirit blowing afresh on us and bringing us uh, forward, uh, kind of propelling us into all that God has for us. So uh, if you're tracking us week by week, first week was the introduction and the sharing of the prophetic word. Last week I talked about the fact that uh, Ezekiel's journey in the Valley of Dry Bones started with God uh, deliberately leading him by his spirit to encounter and feel the pain of the brokenness and uh, the real situation for Israel. And then from there, um, we start the process of transformation, which is what we're gonna be beginning today. And today, we're gonna to be looking at, uh, at the power of prophecy. The power of prophecy, or put another way, um, the ability for us to change our world with the words we speak. And uh, I'm going to read Ezekiel 37 again because I want us to uh, really take hold of this whole chapter, really, and spend some time reading it and reflecting on it. So we can never read it too many times. But then I'm going to draw out a couple of things, uh, particularly about the power of our words from it. So it says this. It says, The hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, son of man, can these bones live? I said, sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together bone to bone. I looked and tendons and flesh appeared on them and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy son of man and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says, come breath from the four winds and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me and breath entered them. They came to life and stood upon their feet, a vast army. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the people of Israel. They say our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. My people, I'm going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord and I will open your graves and bring you up from them. I will put my spirit in you and you will live and will, and will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and I have done it, declares the Lord. And as I say, it's a famous story. It's an interesting story. And as I uh, have been reading it over uh, the last few weeks, uh, two things that, that strike me, one of the ways um, to understand the significance of any passage in the Bible is to look at repeated language and uh, look at things that occur over and over again because the author is uh, trying to make a point through it. And uh, when you track through that passage, uh, one of the repeated uh, phrases is, is sovereign Lord and it's about God and it comes back over and over again. And it's partly because we get a dialogue between Ezekiel and God, but also then because God uh, directs Ezekiel in his, in his prophesying and in his acting. And uh, one of the uh, things that that tells me is this whole passage is about the activity of God 
And in 2024, if it's going to be a year of activation, that's not going to be because I have a smart idea and organise it well. It's going to be because God moves and that goes beyond anything that I could do or we could do corporately together. And part of what this passage says over and over again is this is the work of God. And the reality is the restoration, the resurrection of Israel was a supernatural thing that needed the supernatural power of God to make it happen. Nobody could have brought dry bones back to even reform into a skeleton, let alone have flesh and blood and then become an army. That has to be the work of God. And so one of the themes of this is we so need to be rooted in God. We so need to be God focused. We so need to hear what God is speaking to us. But the second thing that comes out of the passage and that we hear over and over again is the power of the prophetic. And Ezekiel is uh, where um, the book of Ezekiel is put in the Old Testament. It's in the prophetic writing. And uh, and the number of books there are all people who were experienced in hearing God's word and then speaking it out to see change come. And Ezekiel was a prophet, and so he was used to speaking out. But actually, the real transformation happens in Ezekiel 37 is because God speaks to him over and over again, speak this and then see it happen. Speak this and then see it happen. Speak this and then see it happen. And probably the the key pattern or rhythm or thing that brings change and transformation that we see in this passage is Ezekiel prophesying, speaking the word of God. And the reality is the word of God has the ability to shape and transform and create wonderful things. You know, the creation story in Genesis uh, chapter 1 that we're very familiar with, it starts and says, In the beginning God created the heavens and earth. The earth was formless and desolate emptiness, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. The Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. So they got the breath of God uh, hovering, just getting ready, brooding, just getting ready for something to begin. Then God said, Let there be light and light appeared. And it was the word of God spoken under the leading of the spirit of God that started the process of creation. And so we know this world was put together by the creative power of the word of God. And so our words have the ability to create. Our words have the ability to fashion and form. Our words have the ability to change environments and contexts and culture. And uh, in the New Testament, we see at the start of John's uh, gospel, uh, and obviously the New Testament starts with the breaking in of Jesus. John records it this way. In the beginning was the word. So he's harking back to the Genesis uh, story. And the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him and apart from him, not one thing came into being that, it, uh, that has come into being. And he carries on and in John 1.14 says, the word became flesh. And so Jesus is God's word put in a human person. And so if you want to know what God is like, look at Jesus. Jesus is the fullness of God contained in a human body. If you want to know what God thinks about uh, people, look at how Jesus interacted with people. If you want to know what God uh, gets upset about, look at the things that Jesus got upset about. If you want to see the way that God acts, look at the way that Jesus acted. Because Jesus is our revelation. He's everything that God is summed up in a person. And in John 1.14, he says... um, The word became flesh and dwelt amongst us, and we saw his glory, glory as of of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And it was a gracious word that God spoke in Jesus, but it was also a truthful word that God spoke in Jesus. And as I was saying, we can tell what God is like by looking at the person and the picture of Jesus. So if you're going to start reading the Bible anyway, read the Gospels, read the story about Jesus, and then interpret the rest of the Bible when you read it in the light of what Jesus said. That's the best way of doing it. It. But again, it brings us back to the point that, uh, that John is emphasizing that our words have the ability to shape. And if there's a God-given ability on our words to bring something good, then we have a responsibility to use our words well, because our words will shape our environment The question is, are they shaping it for good or for bad? And Ezekiel gets hold of the power of words 
God speaks to him, and because he speaks out what God says, it forms something really good. But if he hadn't done that, he probably wouldn't have had such a great result, and he may even have caused more debris because he was aligning not with God's word. And in the book of Proverbs, I like the book of Proverbs, there's lots of uh, wisdom for everyday life in it, but there's loads in the book of Proverbs about the power of words. And I'll uh, read some of these verses. Um, I think they're really insightful for our life. So Proverbs 18, verse 21, you probably know this. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. And again, the writer of Proverbs is simply saying, you can speak words that create life and hope and goodness, or you can create words that tear down and destroy and bring death. And you will eat the fruit of the words that you speak. That's quite an interesting thing to take on board. We will eat the fruit of the words we speak because words will create something. The question is whether it creates in line with what God says or whether we end up aligning ourselves ultimately with the enemy who comes to steal, kill and destroy because we break down with words. One of the things we were struck when we had small kids was the number of shops you could go around and go around the clothing department and you'd have t-shirts you could buy for your kids with words written on them. And uh, some of the words would be really great, but some of the words would be really not great. And uh, we were always amazed at parents who bought not great words, even they might seem like they were a joke. But we were like, why would we put that on the chest of one of our kids? Surely we want them to know they're loved, that they're celebrated over, that they're beautiful, that they're, they have infinite worth. That's the only words I'm going to write on my kid's T-shirt. Because I understand the power of words and that death and life are in the power of the tongue. Proverbs 16, verse 24. Pleasant words are a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. It's nice, isn't it? Pleasant words are a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. So researchers uh, disagree on exactly how many times it is, but um, it is something like between five and ten positive words need to be spoken to an individual to counter the impact of one negative word. So it's not a one-on-one. If I speak a negative word and then I speak a positive word, one cancels out the other. Psychologists will tell you it's more like five to ten positive words are needed to counter the power of a negative one. And it is because most of us have insecurity or vulnerabilities on the inside. And so when somebody speaks a negative word to it, it lands on that. And those uh, vulnerabilities magnify the impact of the negative word. And so we receive it. You know, I could do a wonderful preach like this on a Sunday morning and get uh, 10 people coming up to me saying that's a great word or God really spoke, whatever. I could have one person upset about one bit of it. And which bit of feedback do you think will be the one that I will reflect on the most and last with me the longest? It's the power of the negative. And the writer of Proverbs knows this and so is saying pleasant words are a honeycomb. They're sweet to the soul. And so if we're meant to be a loving, encouraging environment, we need to be an environment where we speak words that build up, that soothe souls, that bring healing. And we need to be a community that curbs the negative. Someone once said that, uh, that uh, uh, criticism is just poorly given feedback. And, uh, and, and I think that's a good attitude towards criticism, actually, that in every uh, uh, critic there is normally something that can be learned from the feedback. But if, neg- if, if criticism is poorly given feedback, why don't we embrace the fact this could be really good feedback and give it in a much better way, because it's easier for somebody to receive. Proverbs 12, verse 18 says, There is one who speaks rashly like the thrusts of a sword. What a picture of the power of, of words, in particular angry words. There's one who speaks rashly in the thrusts of a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. What do you speak out in anger? What do you speak out in the moment? I think often uh, um, Jesus says what's in the mouth speaks of the overflow of the heart. 
So our words show us what's going on inside. And it's often in those moments of squeezing and anger. What comes out then shows you what is rooted there in your heart and often what you need healing from and transformation in. Because it's in those ouch moments that we really find out when somebody cuts us up when we're driving or something goes wrong in the home or somebody really has a go at us and we get really angry. It's what pours out of our mouth then that that will be rooted somewhere in truth that you believe on the inside that probably is contrary to God's perspective on you and God's best for you. And those moments, they're revelation of stuff that we need healing and restoration on in our lives. Proverbs 10, 19, uh, when there are many words, transgression is unavoidable, but he who restrains his lips is wise. It's really interesting, isn't it? Because sometimes we talk about making your words count. And what the writer in Proverbs is basically saying is if you lose lots of words, um, some of them will cause damage somewhere along the way because you're just using so many words. Why don't you button your lips a little bit and only say the words that you've thought about and that have an intention because then they will really count. Um, and Proverbs 18 verse 7, a fool's mouth is his ruin and his lips are the snare of his soul. So again, lots and lots of warnings about our mouth because it's a reminder that one of the key ways that we create, that we shape, that we form other people's lives are through the words that we speak over them, the words that we pray over them, uh, the words that we share with them. And so in Ezekiel 37, the starting point of resurrection life coming was Ezekiel speaking what God was speaking. So let's be a people who in 2024, maybe uh, one of the disciplines we need to come on, uh, under is... is a discipline on our lips. You know, um, James chapter 3, uh, James is a book in the New Testament, lots of practical tips, very like in lots of ways the Sermon on the Mount, lots of nitty gritty everyday stuff in it. But in James chapter 3 verse 6 he says, the tongue is a fire, the very world of iniquity. The tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our life and is set on fire by hell. And what he's basically saying is, is bad words have the potential to create a fire. And uh, I've seen that in church life, actually. I've seen people um, use careless words or uh, words that are not true and create massive storms. Um, and he's, he's just saying, don't do that because you're undermining the work of God. You're undermining what God wants to do. Uh, Recognise the power that you have in your tongue. Actually, later on in James, he says that he who's able to bridle his tongue, like a horse is bridled with a bridle, restrained with, he's able to um, restrain the whole of his body, uh, which tends to imply if you can get control over what you say, because that says you're getting control of what's in your heart, according to Jesus, then your life is likely to align a lot better. So words are really, really powerful. And let's take seriously what words we take in, what, what words we let speak to us, what you read, what you watch, um, what you listen to. Let's take seriously that, but also let's take seriously as well the words that we shape and speak to other people. And when you look through the Bible at how different people lived, you see that those people that were successful in fulfilling what God had called them, quite often a key to their success was being rooted in God's word. And so Joshua, one of my heroes, Joshua led God's people into possessing the promised land in the book of Joshua. But in Joshua chapter 1, where he first steps into leadership, God says to him this. He says, keep this book of the law on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you'll be prosperous and successful. So what God says to Joshua is, if you're going to be successful in leading this people into promised land, firstly, align your life right. And if you're going to align your life right, then speak my word. Speak it. Read it. Meditate on it, reflect it. And then God says, then you will make your way prosperous. So in other words, God is saying to Joshua, your destiny is in your hands. Actually, if in these moments you root yourself in the word of God, you'll be intentional about reading it, spending time in it, speaking it, then it will make your way successful. 
And alternatively, if you don't, then don't be surprised when you're not successful. When we see Jesus begin his ministry in Matthew chapter 4, the Spirit takes him into the wilderness and he gets tempted by the devil for 40 days. So it's a key point of, of pressure for Jesus. And every time the devil um, tempts Jesus, Jesus' response is to speak the word of God back to him. And it's interesting because all of Jesus' responses in the wilderness are taken from the same part of the Old Testament. They're all taken from Deuteronomy chapter 6 through to 8, which is the story in the Old Testament of Israel in the wilderness. So as Jesus encounters the uh, challenges of a wilderness... He uh, goes back in his knowledge of the scriptures to what the Bible says historically about the wilderness and he draws nuggets of truth from it. And when the enemy comes against him, he then fires back, no, but God says this, no, but God says this, no, but God says this. And Jesus overcomes the enemy in the wilderness, but he overcomes through the power of his words and knowing what God is saying and aligning his words with what God has spoken. And then in Ephesians chapter 6, we're going to look at Ephesians chapter 6 later on in this series, but in Ephesians chapter 6 where Paul gives us the uh, armour of God, and we'll look at it later on because it's an army that's being created in in Ezekiel 37. But there's only one offensive weapon that God gives us in the armour of God. There's a belt of truth to hold everything else in place. There's the shoes of the readiness to uh, share the good news of Jesus. There's a breastplate of righteousness. There's a helmet of salvation. Uh, There's a shield of faith. And there's one offensive weapon. And what is that? It's the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Because words have the ability to cut down the enemy. Words have the ability to release something of God. And in this uh, chapter transformation happens because Ezekiel speaks the word of God. He speaks out and God is able to create or recreate through Ezekiel because he understands the power. He understands what he's activated every time his mouth speaks. And it's interesting because in verses 5 to 6, it says, This is what the Sovereign Lord says to these bones. I'll make breath enter you, you'll come to life. I'll attach tendons to you, I'll make flesh come on you, cover you with skin. I'll put breath in you and you'll come to life. Then you'll know that I am the Lord. Go straight on. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, a noise, a rattling sound, bones came together, bone to bone. And so the process happened. But it's as Ezekiel was prophesying. What does that mean for us in the beginning of a year of activation? It means let's start speaking out the word of God. If you think about it from Ezekiel's perspective, you know, I talked last week about the fact that God made Ezekiel sit in the debris. And he made him take a good look at it. So Ezekiel had seen the disappointment, the hope that had disappeared from uh, Israel. He'd seen the disjointedness of all of the bones. He'd seen they were not just dry, they were very dry. It was a, a desperate situation, seemed totally impossible. But then God says to Ezekiel, but speak this because I say it. And you see, the environment around Ezekiel didn't encourage words of faith to be spoken, but God did. The environment around Ezekiel didn't say, believe for this change, but God said, believe for this change. And it was as Ezekiel spoke out the words that God gave him, the environment around started to shift. God will change the environment around you. God will change what happens in your life. God will change what happens through you. God will change the environment around you if you speak his word over it and declare it and prophesy it. And one of the keys for us in 2024, if we're going to see supernatural activation, is to keep declaring the word of God, no matter what we might see physically with our eyes. You've got a child and they're not walking in the ways of Jesus. Speak out that they will do. Pray out that they will do. You've got a promise of healing that you haven't seen yet fulfilled in your life speak it out pray it out prophesy it out it may not look like it right now that does not matter because we're inviting the breath of God to breathe and God do what only he can do and we walk uh, by faith not by sight So we may see the debris. We may ask God to heal our our, our heartache. We may ask him to bring comfort. But then we stand up and we speak to it and we say, no more. We're going to see the light of God. We're going to see the breakthrough of God. We're going to see the promises of God come. 
What words do you need to be declaring over your life today? I've referred to this before, but Craig Rochelle, who leads the biggest church in the States, uh, uh, Life Church, he has these daily declarations. You can download it off their website. And he has words that he declares every single day over his life. And he will say that has changed him enormously as a man. Because he will say even though he leads a big, successful church, he's he's struggled with his own insecurity and unworthiness for many years. But it's only speaking out what God speaks over him that has brought change and transformation. So every morning he gets up and he says, I am a child of God. I'm a faith-filled, life-speaking, fully devoted follower of Christ. I'm Christ ambassadors. I'm a masterpiece. I'm chosen in Christ alone. I'm determined to love God and people with everything I have. I'm a child of God. I'm strengthened by God who upholds me, protects me, and defends me. And what Craig does is he settles his life to be aligned in truth. So often we undermine ourselves with our self-talk. Oh, that wasn't very good. Oh, you're useless. Oh, you always do this. Oh, you're never going to do that. None of that self-talk will ever help you in life because all it will do is undermine, because there's a power in words, there's a creative power, it will become a self-fulfilling prophecy. So we need to realign our lives with the truth. I am forgiven. I am set free. I am more than a conqueror in Jesus. And as we declare some of these truths, I can do all things through Christ Jesus who gives me strength. As we declare these truths over our lives, do you know what? Something changes on the inside and you start to rise up. What a different people we might be instead of feeding our mouths first thing in the morning if we fed our spirits and spoke out what God said. But do you know what? Also in 2024, I believe many of us have got prophetic words that God has spoken over our lives. Restore as a family of churches. We have prophetic words that God has spoken over us as a church and you know what we need to start declaring them again we need to be speaking them again our reality might look like a valley of very dry disconnected bones but those words are still if they're given by God still have the power of God attached to them and we can speak them out and breathe them out and we will see life come as a result of them Dust off those words. You know, I've got a book that I write some of the key prophetic words for my life down in. And I regularly dig it out and look over it. Because I need to live in those words because it's God's verdict. And I want my life to be lined with the creative power of those words. And so I want to take my stand like Ezekiel did, and I want to prophesy an awakening over North London and into Essex. I want to prophesy salvation into my community. I want to prophesy transformation into my family. I want to prophesy all the words and the promises God has spoken over me. I want to prophesy them and declare them. What about this year? If we got up every morning and we took even one of those words that God's spoken over us, one of those significant prophecies and we prophesied it and we declared it and we prayed it every day do you know what will happen faith will start to rise in your heart that prophetic word will start to be activated you will start to see god's resurrection power start to bring change what was the key to ezekiel seeing an army formed it was god getting hold of his words his aligning his words to what god was speaking and then him declaring it and each time he declared it change happens. Each time you declare it, change happens in the spirit. Each time you declare it, that victory comes nearer. Each time you declare it. But what are you speaking out? What are you agreeing with? For some of us, our starting point is we need to repent of the lies that we've received, lived under, and agreed with. Then we need to turn our backs on it. We need to turn away from it. That's what true repentance means. It means to, to turn 180 degrees. And I'll demonstrate it by turning 90 degrees. We'll go 180 degrees. You'll see my back. But we need to turn totally from it. And then we need to open up a new way of living. Our words will determine our fruitfulness in 2024 because there's creative power over them. Let's use our words well. I'm going to pray. Lord Jesus, I just want to pray, Lord, for all of us, Lord, where we have been convicted of not using our words well. And Lord, the truth is there is creative power in our words. 
And we are eating the fruit of our words in many situations and circumstances. And Lord, I want to pray that you'll forgive me for where I've spoken out negative things, for where I've agreed with negative self-talk, where I've laid down your word and I've spoken out and agreed with words that are not yours. Just reminded of Isaiah in Isaiah 6 when he sees the glory of God and he falls on his knees and says, I'm a man of unclean lips. And then an angel comes and takes a coal from the fire and cleanses his lips with the coal. Lord, I ask in these moments, Lord, that you will come to a man of unclean lips and cleanse my lips. And Father, where my lips represent something in my heart, will you come and cleanse my heart? And Father, as I begin 2024, Lord, I want to begin this next chapter, this next season, declaring your truth over my life. Declaring, Lord, the promises that you've given me, the prophetic words that you've given me. And I prophesy this will be a year of healing. I prophesy this will be a year of salvation. I prophesy this will be a year of abundance. I prophesy this will be a year of supernatural uh, provision. I prophesy this will be a year of healing. I prophesy this will be a year of restoration. I prophesy this will be a year of fruitfulness on every level. I prophesy this will be a year of health. I prophesy this will be a year of the prodigals returning. I prophesy this will be a year of promises being fulfilled. And Father, may we uh, regain, Lord, may we uh, re-embrace, Lord, the power of our words and your prophetic words spoken in the power of your Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a go this week. This week, each day, declare something of the word of God over your life. Declare some truth. Take a prophetic word. Declare it. Speak it out. Prophesy it out. I guarantee it will start to make a difference. And then come back and join us next week. And we'll take our next step in our journey together from Ezekiel 37. God bless you. Have a great week.